Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you guys are doing well. My name is Judy Cho and I am a nutritional therapy practitioner. I also am the author of Carnivore Cure. I help clients get to root cause healing, which oftentimes is gut healing. So I'm very happy to share this interview today. I had the pleasure of sitting with Dr. Brownstein. He is a practitioner of holistic medicine and is the medical director of the Center for Holistic Medicine in Michigan. Dr. Brown has lectured internationally to physicians, and if you just search his name, you will find a lot of videos with his information. He is a wealth of information. I'm really happy to have him on. He is amazing just the fact that he wrote 16 books or maybe more. I highly recommend that you check out his books. They're really good. I will share some links to some of his books. I hope that one of the things you guys take away from this interview is that you shouldn't fear salt and you shouldn't fear iodine. If you are part of the minority that actually does get affected by taking it, then you may want to work with a practitioner. But in general, most of us really need salt and iodine. Let's get right into the conversation. Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. And today I'm very excited. I have with me Dr. Brownstein. And if you don't know him already, you are definitely going to love him. So hi, Dr. Brownstein. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks Um, for having me, Judy. Yeah, thank you again for coming on. I'm very excited to talk to you. If you can share with the audience, you know, who you are and what you specialize in. Um, I'm a family, a board certified family doctor, and I've been practicing medicine close to 30 years. And I, I practice in um, the Detroit suburbs. And I've been doing holistic medicine for just over 28 years or so. And um, so I specialize in using bioidentical hormones, um, nutritional therapies, and, um, you know, ozone, iodine, you know, you know, looking for imbalances in people and helping them correct it. Right, right. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Um, I interviewed um, someone you know closely, um, Lynn Farrow, and we talked a lot about iodine, and there were some points of the conversation that we didn't get into in terms of iodine. So she talked a lot about supplements and companion supplements with iodine. So um, I guess my first question is, is there such a thing as too much iodine? And then with that, um, does everyone need to be taking these companion supplements? Well, I mean, there's such a thing as too much anything, you know, you you can get too much water and um, become overloaded. So sure, sure, there's problem with too much of any supplement, any, any, anything out there. So I think one of the more important things is to, you know, I, I do what I was taught in medical school. I take a history, I do a physical exam, I order laboratory tests, and then, you know, I try and put the picture together, you know, where I think um, somebody needs to go or, you know, where the deficiencies are and where they're not deficient. And so through proper testing and proper monitoring, I think you can it's hard to be iodine overloaded because the kidneys are very easy to release large amounts of iodine. Um, And there, there can be problems with iodine like allergic reactions and, you know, a Herxheimer reaction, which is a reaction that occurs when your body goes through sort of a detox reaction, you give someone something and they have to get rid of other things from that and their body can just be overloaded and make people sick. But I mean, used appropriately, iodine is very safe, very easy. As far as overloading someone with iodine, I I don't really, I mean, I guess someone in kidney failure, maybe you you could do that, but with normal kidney function, that really shouldn't be the case. Well, I think in, you know, mainstream, the thought is that more than just even a couple drops of like the Lugol's at 2% is dangerous. And, you know, there are some mainstream thyroid doctors that are advocates of not overly doing iodine. So what is the discrepancy? Because for example, there's that iodoral that's like 12 and a half milligrams. And so these kind of conventional doctors would say that's way too much iodine. So why, why are there such differing opinions on iodine? Well, I mean, the whole iodine story in, in Western, in our country goes back nearly a hundred years. And in the early 20th century, as you know, we were colonizing the United States and growing our population and moving from the East coast to the West coast, you know, a problem developed and it first showed itself in the Midwest where I live, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, all the states bordering the Great Lakes and, and down, then down through the center of the country, you know, that weren't bordering ocean water. And the problem was that 
people were having thyroid problems and they were developing goiter or swelling of the thyroid. And the same phenomenon was occurring in, in farm animals. They were developing abnormal thyroid function and they weren't growing to the right size. And there was a, there was a huge worry, not so much for the people having goiter, but there was a huge worry at the time for the animals having this thyroid dysfunction that the, the worry was the animals weren't procreating correctly and weren't growing to the right size. So there was a concern from the highest levels of, our, of the U.S. government that the burgeoning population of the United States was going to outstrip the food supply. Mm -hmm. And there would be, you know, huge consequences to that. So in the mid-1920s, <clears throat> there was a researcher um, outside of Cleveland who had written a paper about iodine in medical school and, and, and they, the, the government contacted him and said, we, we need to study why, what's wrong with the farm animals thyroid, you know, thyroid glands. Why are they getting goiter? Why aren't they growing to the right size and not procreating correctly? And what can we do about it? So he quickly ascertained, you know, which was known a hundred years before that, that iodine deficiency was the you know, most common cause of goiter in humans. And he put varying amounts of iodine in the animal feed and found the lowest amount of iodine that corrected the thyroid abnormalities in the animals, got rid of the goiter, they grew to the right size, they began procreating correctly. From that, he ascertained by weight the amount of iodine humans would need, the minimal amount of iodine humans would need. And that's how iodized salt came to be. So um, salt has properties where you can add a little bit of iodine to it and it will bind to it very easily and people can get it that way. So he did the first studies in, you know, outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And the next set of studies were done in Michigan. What he found was that correcting iodine deficiency helped the, you know, goiter problem in adolescent girls in both Michigan and Ohio. You know, it was something like 87, I don't have the numbers directly in my head, but, you know, it was a huge difference uh, of, between the girls who took the iodine and girls who didn't take the iodine and the improvement in thyroid function. So from that work, the government mandated, you know, a small amount of iodine and iodized salt will take care of iodine needs for the population. And really iodine wasn't looked at for anything but the thyroid gland. And lo and behold, that tiny amount of iodine in salt really did markedly lessen the goiter epidemic that was occurring not only in the Midwestern United States, but it was occurring all over the country in the 1920s, but higher in the Midwestern United States. So really from that moment on, once, once the goiter epidemic was taken care of with iodine, medicine really had no use for iodine. They, they, they didn't realize its value, didn't realize its function. They didn't realize the other glands also need iodine. The breast, the ovaries, the uterus, the prostate, the pancreas, salivary glands, you know, all concentrate huge amounts of iodine. Really, they just focused on the thyroid gland, <clears throat> which has the highest concentration of iodine. So the, the interest for iodine fell off. You know, by the time I got to med school in the mid 1980s, you know, I was wasn't taught much about nutrition at all. We had a three hour course on it. That that was it, and the course consisted of teaching us about scurvy and, and beriberi and you know severe nutritional deficiencies of single nutrients. Um, and what we learned about iodine was. Um, <clears throat> Iodized salt cured the thyroid problem that was occurring in the early 20th century. And, you know, iodine deficiency, deficiency doesn't exist anymore. Well, I, I bought into that and I, you know, I believe that when I was taught it. Um, but then here I go starting a holistic practice um, a few months after practicing conventional medicine when I realized I didn't like what I was doing in conventional medicine. And I found all these people with thyroid problems that the lab tests weren't picking up. And I started teaching myself how to palpate a thyroid and I found all these people with goiters that, you know, nobody was feeling the thyroid, so nobody knew it was there. And the goiter epidemic was still occurring. You know, I, I, as soon as I started palpating thyroids, I started feeling it and seeing it again. And, you know, I started looking at the thyroid gland and, you know, what can make it better? You know, what are the things that, that, that you can do? And, you know, you always come up to iodine when you look at thyroid because the highest concentration of Iodine in the body occurs in the thyroid gland. You can't make thyroid hormone without iodine. Right. Um, you can't, so you can't make any hormone in, in the body without iodine, including the adrenals, the ovaries, testes, uterus, you know, the breasts, you know, you need iodine for all these tissues. So, um, um, you know, once I was properly educated in iodine, I started looking through the literature 
um, and finding, you know, iodine deficiency is not a thing of the past. It's still occurring now. In fact, iodine levels have fallen over nearly 50% across the, over the last 40 years across the United States. And it's my belief that this falling iodine level is directly associated with one in seven women having breast cancer, one in three men having prostate cancer, <clears throat> thyroid cancer being the fastest growing cancer out there, and then a whole host of other endocrine problems, you know, from those glandular tissues I mentioned before. That's how I came to write my book, Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. Um, so medical research still believes today that iodine salt took care of iodine deficiency. <clears throat> That's sim sim simply not true. I've checked over 7,000 patients between me and my partners for their iodine levels, over 97% are low. I can tell you, and I'm not wow. patting my own back here, the only ones that come in with normal iodine levels are the ones that have read my book or something similar to that and are coming in and taking iodine. Everyone else is deficient in iodine. And this wow. is across the country right now. So that just goes back to the question, you know, it's, it would be one thing if these kind of mainstream doctors thought it's harmful <laughs> to take iodine. Um, but I mean, if they just said, okay, um, we don't really need iodine, but why do they go to the other end where it's, it can cause hypothyroid, it can damage your thyroid if um, we do not need that um, iodine, um, especially at more doses than maybe like one drop a day of the Lugol's like 2%, which is really, really low. Well, I mean, one of the, you know, when you look back at the iodine literature, there was, there was always controversy with iodine. Okay. And um, there was controversy in the 1920s with iodine, and there's still controversy today. So, you know, one of the wives' tales out there is, well, iodine, if you take iodine beyond what's an iodine salt, you're going you're gonna to cause um, iodine-associated thyrotoxicosis. Mm -hmm. That can occur where you get an you know, overactive thyroid gland from taking too much taking iodine. But I've been checking levels. I've been using iodine for over 20 years. I have three patients that happen to, and it only happens under one on one very rare condition called an autonomously, autonomously functioning nodule, where you have a nodule in your thyroid gland that's just out of control. Okay. And you give it a little bit of iodine and it starts making a lot of thyroid hormone. Those patients can't take iodine. They'll produce a lot of thyroid hormone. They'll become thyrotoxic. And, and either you do this radionucleotide iodine uptake test to see if they have this, or you it's diagnosed by putting someone on iodine and they get hyperthyroid. It's happened three times uh, in 20 years. It's not very common. My partners have each had a couple of cases. You know, okay. We have thousands of patients on this. And, you know, so it's not very common. So I think that's part of it. Um, and part of it is people don't know about iodine. They just don't understand it. It comes in all these different forms and different charges. And, um, you know, iodine salt took away gorgeous. So what do we need iodine for? Well, if you, you know, I, I tell patients, what if they've had a thyroidectomy? They say, so do I need to take iodine? I'm like, I said, well, do you have skin? Do you, do you have a heart? Do you have a brain? Because all that tissue needs iodine. Um, and, you know, it's not just for thyroid. It's for the rest of the body. Every cell needs and requires iodine. Iodine is an essential item we can't live without. If we don't get enough, we'll die. Um, and the U.S. National Health and, uh, Nutrition Examination Survey has proved that iodine levels have fallen nearly 50% over the last 40 years. Wow. We're a country that's iodine deficient. That's my whole premise of why COVID-19 hit us so hard. Um, because we're in such bad shape health-wise, and particularly from, you know, one of the major things is being iodine deficient, you know, and, and you know, it doesn't take much for a viral illness like coronavirus to, you know, a novel virus that we don't have immunity to, to take us down. And, you know, I mean, look at our country. We have per capita more deaths, more hospitalizations, more ICU stays than any other country on the face of the earth per capita. And we spend the most on healthcare. It's, it's a, you know, We've, it's been a disaster what's happened here. So would you say that these, this kind of epidemic of, you know, hypothyroid and people having Hashimoto's and is a lot related to an iodine deficiency? Yes. Well, I'm, you know, look, after testing 7,000 people, over 97% test low on iodine. Iodine deficiency is alive and well in the United States. And again, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself, but one in seven women have breast cancer. One in three men have prostate cancer. Thyroid cancer is the fastest growing cancer. We have epidemics of ovarian, uterine cancer. This can all be tied to iodine deficiency, since you need iodine to maintain the normal architecture of the glandular tissue of the body. And iodine deficiency 
you know, a continuum unfolds where at the beginning, the tissues, the glandular tissues become nodular. You form cysts in the tissues. The architecture gets disrupted from iodine deficiency. If it goes on longer, they become hard and nodular. If it goes on longer, they take a, take a hyperplastic appearance, which is a term for looking at a cell under a microscope that's precancerous. Okay. And then the end of that pathway is cancer. And in animal test tube and humans, iodine um, repletion has been shown to not only stop that continuum, but to reverse it so the wow. cells can return back to normal. It's one of the reasons iodine is known as an apoptotic substance where it's cancer cells, which are fast, fast growing and dividing cells, iodine can stop that process in its tracks. And um, does it work every time? No, it doesn't work every time for that, but I've seen it work. And you know, it, it, before they get cancer, we should be replenishing iodine levels so hopefully they don't get cancer. Right. in the first place. Right. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. I was going to ask you something. Uh, oh, okay. Hold on. I'm just going to make a noise. So would you say that then everyone should kind of, st- do you think starting with that like 12 and a half milligram, the tablet is a safe place to start? Or do you think it's better that people do that kind of like the 24 hour urine test? What are your thoughts about that? All right. So I'm going to answer that in one second. So you made that noise. Is that to get your brain back in line? Because that happens to me. I'm going to use that. What was that noise for? No, so when you're <laughs> so when you're editing the video, you'll see a big uptick in sound, so you know you need to edit there. <laughs> I thought it was some trick that I could use for myself when I lose my train of thought. Oh no, no. Um, all right. So, so iodine dosing. I worked with the my mentor in iodine, Dr. Guy Abraham, who uh, oh. you know taught me more about iodine than he'll ever know. Um, he, he was really something. He went through all the literature that he could find and, you know, allowed me to come into his circle. And, uh, you know, I used to fly out to California four, four to six times a year. and We'd spend time in his lab just doing basic bench research and going through articles and talking things through. And so we, he developed the iodine loading test, which is a 24-hour test where you <clears throat> take a known amount of iodine at, you know, time zero and you collect urine for 24 hours and you see how much iodine comes out in that time period. And I should say the day before that you do a 24 hour urine to see where the people are as a baseline. Then you do it, you take the iodine the next day and collect another 24 hours. So from that data, we've ascertained that generally 12 and a half milligrams of iodine is close to what the Japanese take in on a daily basis, just on their diet. They get a lot of iodine from their food supply, such as they're using iodine in their fertilizer mm-hmm. and um, seaweed. And, you know, they, they eat a lot more iodine-containing foods than we do. So they have markedly less breast cancer and prostate cancer and thyroid problems than we do as well. So Dr. Abraham and I did, and a couple of others, did um, some research looking at, you know, how do you, how do you saturate the body with iodine and saturate all those cells that are in the thyroid, ovaries, uterus, breast, prostate, pancreas, white blood cells, you know, everywhere, red blood cells. Um, you know, and so through, through our research, it's somewhere between 12 to 25 milligrams a day, um, generally can saturate the body with iodine if that's a good thing. And that's what you want to do. Now, I do think that's a good thing and that's what you want to do, but anything less than that, this, the iodine receptors are not iodinated and that leads into other problems from our toxic world we live in and the toxic halides, such as bromide and fluoride, which are, which are prevalent in our you know, in our life, you know, we're fluoride in our water supply and bromides. Uh, um, and this, these are, these are chemicals in the same, same, um, table of elements, the <laughs> <line. laughs> table, of, table of elements. And, um, they're in, they're in group seven of the periodic table of elements. So, mm-hmm. so one halide can competitively inhibit another halide. And, um, so if you get too much bromide and fluoride in your body is going to release iodine. If you get enough iodine in your body, can release, release bromide and fluoride. So fluoride we get from our water supply, bromide, I'm probably sitting on it in this chair since right. the cushion and chairs and mattresses have it. Carpet that my feet are on right now have, are full of bromide. Um, bromide's in our food supply and a lot of bakery products and right. you know, flour has been brominated. And you know, in my testing over the years, you know, not only people are iodine deficient, they're bromide toxic. And, so they're, they, instead of having iodinated thyroid hormones, they're brominating the thyroid hormones. Now, it's been shown in medical research to occur, in the literature to occur, 
No one really knows if that's a good thing or not. I, I don't think that's a good thing. Our thyroid hormones are supposed to be iodinated. It's supposed to have an iodine atom attached to it, not bromide. And bromide is a known toxic substance to the body. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a healthy thing. And I wrote about that a lot in my iodine book. Um, right. and, and I'll put the links to your book in the show notes. And I've um, seen the book and it's really good. So, um, so wait, I don't think I answered your question. What was the question before I clapped to myself? Yeah, I think it was just how much should we take? Yeah, how much should we take? So, so anyway, so 12 to 25 milligrams. I have most of my patients on doses like that. If okay. they don't have breast, ovarian, uterine, thyroid, pancreatic, um, whatever I missed there, uh, testicular, any other glandular problem that I missed there, I, I apologize, but that's, if that's in there, they'll need more iodine. Um, oh, need so more. if you have cystic breast or you have breast cancer or, or someone has prostate cancer or thyroid, you know, Hashimoto's disease or thyroid cancer, or something, they'll need generally a little bit more iodine because those glands are generally toxic with bromide. They have a much more inflammatory problems going on and you need a little bit more iodine to clear that up. Um, but for most people, 12 to 25 milligrams seems to change that 24-hour urine test in a favorable light and seems to, you know, help them get ready for problems like COVID when it comes. So, you, you know, the, the body can fight back against it. Do you, um, I've, you know, I've had some clients where they, when they even start with half of that amount, their body just freaks out. So why does that happen? And then will the companion supplements kind of take care of that? So like the, um, selenium, the magnesium, uh, the vitamin C and all that. So we mentioned the periodic table of elements. Group seven is the halides, mm -hmm. uh, iodine, chloride, bromide, and fluoride. Fluoride. Um, the um, so those those halides can competitively inhibit one another. Two okay. of those halides are essential. Two are known toxins to the body. Sure. Um, the essential ones are chloride and iodine. The toxins are fluoride and I'm sorry, iodine and chloride are the essential ones. Fluoride and bromide are the toxic ones. The problem we've got right now is we're, we're getting overexposed to fluoride and bromide, as I said before. So when you give someone iodine who's iodine deficient, you can, in our world, you can, in our modern world, you can almost guarantee that they're going to be, if they're not taking iodine, they're gonna generally be iodine deficient as the NHANES studies have shown mm -hmm. and my research has shown and they're gonna be overloaded in bromide and fluoride. So when you give them iodine, the body's the competitive inhibition is going to occur. So iodine is gonna to bind to its iodine receptors and the body's gotta release that fluoride and bromide that's in there. Now, if their body can't handle that, they don't feel good. And they can get flu-like and they can get fatigued and headachey and anxiety and, you know, I mean, it's, it's known as a Herxheimer reaction, you know, a detoxification reaction. Right. Um, and so, so, I don't usually, you know, I don't meet someone and say, hey, you know, nice to meet you. Go take iodine. What I do is, an, you know, initial workup and full history, full physical exam, full laboratory tests, looking for nutrition and hormonal imbalances, you know, hair testing, looking for mineral metal problems. So when I, when I start someone on iodine, I don't just start them on iodine. Almost everybody's salt deficient. We're going to hopefully get into that or we'll do that in another talk. But salt, which has sodium and chloride in it, chloride is the essential halide. Um, helps to usher out the bromide and, you know, fluoride that's in the body. And, you know, bromide was used years ago in medicine. So bromo seltzer was the precursor to Alka-Seltzer for upset stomach. Bromide was used in many medications. It's, unfortunately, it's still used today in asthma medications. Um, and a lot of inhalers have bromide as part of their chemical makeup. And so people would, years ago, they used a lot more bromide in medicine and people would become bromide toxic. What, the, what would happen is you, you the reason that Judy, do you know how they were treated for bromide toxicity? No. Tons of, tons of rich literature on this is very fascinating. They would salt the bromide out. So wow. they would orally give them a lot of salt to take with a lot of water. And then if they needed it, they give them IVs of sodium chloride and you could just, you could just get an IV of sodium chloride going and it's called salting the bromide out when they were bromide toxic. Okay. So I do this. I do the same thing today. I rarely start someone in iodine without putting them on salt first or, or concurrently because most people are deficient in salt when you check basic chemistries. And so I use unrefined salt. Um, I have a book on this, Salt Your Way to Health. And I, I believe the reason I'm seeing such less problems with iodine 
is because I'm using it in conjunction with a holistic treatment regimen, which frequently include well, almost everyone gets more salt, you know, or advice to take more salt and vitamin C, you know, and whatever other nutrients that they're deficient in. Um, you know, common ones that I see on people is vitamin C, vitamin, you know, B vitamins, magnesium. Um, where I live, selenium is not deficient in our soil. We don't see a lot of selenium deficiency. So the cofactors you're referring to earlier, um, salt is one of the best things to prevent Herxheimer reaction or you know, bromide toxicity as iodine gets repleted. And magnesium is also really helpful um, you know, for that. And, and I see a lot of magnesium deficiency. Vitamin C helps keep the inflammatory, you know, as, as people release these bromide and fluorides, they get a lot of inflammation. Vitamin C can help keep that down. But I mean, there's many other nutrients I use. And you know, I always tell people, you got to drink enough water. You got to eat good food. You got to get sugar out of your diet. You got to get all those refined carbohydrates out of your diet. So I'm doing all that together when I'm putting them in iodine. But one, one other thing, you know, for someone who's super sensitive, you know, and, and, you know, I see, I'm sure you've got your clients, like I got my patients, you know, these people, they react to aspirins and Tylenols and, you know, they're very highly reactive people. I will not start them on iodine out of the chute. Even though my testing will show that they're iodine deficient, I'll put them on the salt, I'll put them on the vitamin C, I'll put them on magnesium or whatever else they're deficient in and tell them, start the iodine in two weeks. Gotcha. And wait the two weeks to start it. I see very few problems with iodine doing it this way. Do I see problems with iodine? Yes, I see problems with iodine. There, I, I refer to them as once in a blue moon. I see. Yeah, I, I've had clients where... Um they probably took six milligrams or less. So a few drops of the 2% and some of them just started having higher blood pressure, just not feeling well, you know, the headaches, those types of symptoms. And since they're all on lower carb diets, they generally take some mineral salt water. So I don't know if it was a lot of the salt aspect, but they definitely reacted. I had one client that just one drop really made their, you know, body just kind of uh, really react. And so I think she was very hypothyroid. So I think it's a good thing. Um, she said one example was she said she hasn't, she works out really hard, but she never breaks a sweat. And oh, I yeah. guess that's like an indicator of that. Yes, it is. And you know, what I do with salt for someone like that, I'm really, you know, what I, what I would tell a patient like that, who's, you know, not sweating and just highly react. If I'm ascertaining, she's highly reactive to stuff, you know, and let's say I put them on iodine and they react to it. And, you know, I tell them, stop it. Let's wait two weeks and we're going to do this. So the first thing I tell them is up their salt. So I'll put them on a teaspoon to sometimes a tablespoon of salt a day. Make sure they're adequately hydrated. Tell them to clean up their diet and, you know, get refined sugar and refined carbs out of their diet. And, you know, eat healthier food. And then try the iodine in two weeks. And the vast majority can take it without problems. Wow. That's Occasionally... There is a patient here and there, and I, I can tell you maybe one a year or less than that. Who, you know, even at little doses of iodine, they get some negative reactions to it. They have some kind of allergic or whatever energetic problem with iodine, and then we do our best to try and um, you know, work around that or sensitize their bodies to iodine so they can take it again. Sure. And do you think that everyone needs to then forever take the 12 and a half, or is it that you know, once you start kind of detoxing all of the bromide and fluoride, you need less or what are your thoughts with that? It's a good question. So if you stop taking iodine, the body has no stores of iodine. It, it's, okay. it's, you know, we're, we're not camels. We don't have pouches of iodine and water and that stuff. We, we utilize it. And then if you're not getting enough in your daily diet, dietary regimen, you become deficient. So let's say you, you start taking 12 or 25 milligrams of iodine and your breast discs go away and prostate uh, nodules go away and um, goiter and the thyroid goes away and the thyroid feels better and you feel better. And then they, they decide to stop the iodine, you know, whatever, it's a year or something like that. What's going to happen is they'll go right back to where they were because our food supply doesn't, simply does not supply enough iodine for our toxic world today. Our iodine requirements are higher today than they were for our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents. And that, the reason for that is that, number one, our mineral supply of our food has just gone down, you know, over the years um, from poor farming techniques and overuse of pesticides and fertilizers. And number two, our exposure to toxic halides has gone up at the same time we've been, you know, not getting enough iodine in our diet. So, so I call that the double whammy when I lecture about it. I have a slide on that. 
right. you know, uh, this is why so many people are deficient in iodine, why they need to um, keep taking it. Because if you stop it, you're going to get enough bromide and fluoride to start competitively inhibiting iodine. We'll just go back to where you were. So what about kids? Um, should they start supplementing right away as well? Is there an amount that you recommend for young kids? Well, it's the same, same phenomenon. They're growing up in this world that's toxic on bromide and fluoride and deficient in iodine. Absolutely. Look, girls, the longer you wait to supplement iodine, the more problems they're going to have when they're teenagers and when they're adolescents and when they're adults. And, you know, we have a mess in our hands. We, got, we have one in seven women across the United States with breast cancer diagnosed, diagnosed with breast cancer. I see women in their 20s now diagnosed with breast cancer. And I never saw that 30 years ago when I was in med school. And um, we got men with prostate cancer being diagnosed in their 30s now. I never saw that. That was old men, old man stuff, you know, my training years. And now it's common to see men in their 40s and 50s diagnosed, you know, and, you know, I have a few in their 30s. Um, we have thyroid cancer. It's the fastest growing cancer across the United States. I mean, look, all this stuff points to a problem with our glandular tissue, and the, we have a disrupted architecture of the glandular tissue, and iodine deficiency would certainly fit that bill as being the primary cause of that. So what would you, so my, for example, my son, the old, my oldest son is six. So would I give him the 12 and a half, or would I give him half of that, or, you know? Well, I mean, look, it's best to get levels checked and work with a holistic doctor who's skilled with using iodine, but. I dose it down for kids. So no, I wouldn't give a, a six-year-old the same dose I would give a 20-year-old. Right. So you could dose it down, you know, I, I don't know what the size and all that is, but I, I put kids on six milligrams or, you know, babies, you, you know, I haven't used less than that. Um, you know, if they have decent kidney function, they should be able to release whatever excess yeah. iodine that you're giving them anyways. Um, but I dose kids a little bit lower and sure, kids should be taking iodine at a young age. So they can go through adolescence and puberty and, and pregnancy and birthing babies, you know, normally without all these problems that are happening. In your book, you um, have your updated edition has a section on why women before they're even pregnant should be taking iodine. So what, what is that about? Well, th this has been studied for a hundred years and iodine deficiency going into pregnancy is not a good thing for that baby in the womb. And research has, has proven that if the mom is iodine deficient and the baby doesn't get enough iodine, the only source of iodine is coming from the mom, to that baby. Um, the baby's brain and neurologic tissue won't develop normally. Now in severe iodine deficiency in babies, it's known as cretinism. And they have, um, you know, they're small, they're really small body, their, their IQ is really low. There's been dozens and dozens of studies from different cultures showing Mothers who are deficient in iodine have lower IQ babies compared to mothers who are sufficient in iodine. So uh, women of childbearing age should be, have their iodine levels checked and corrected before they become pregnant. And the NHANE study, the government has studied this. Government knows this is going on. Um, I have data that I'm trying to think of my graph. I believe it's, it's in the book, but I believe there's 80% of women of childbearing age Maybe it's not 80, but 60 to 80% of women in the, across the U.S. of childbearing age are low in iodine. Um, right. And it's a disaster. It's just, it's a, I, I have a slide, I, I have this whole little thing that circles. I say, when I, when I make that statement, the next slide says, is, this is a public health disaster that's unparalleled. And it's still ongoing. And I don't, I don't understand why. We know, we know it's out there. We know how to correct it. It's not hard to correct. And we know we're not getting enough of iodine salt these days. And Sure. You know, our iodine needs have gone up over the years, not gone down. And, um, you know, look at how sick our kids are these days. We, we compared to every Western country, every health indicator, we we're last on every one of them, except one we're second to last. And that starts at neonatal mortality to maternal mortality during uh, pregnancy to longevity. We finish last compared to every Western country. And, um, you know, our kids are suffering. Our kids are sicker than ever. The kids have more autoimmune, ADD, cancer, asthma, allergies, eczema than every other Western kid out there. And um, I think I think iodine's maybe not the cure all for everything, but iodine's a big piece of that pie that we're suffering from right now as a society. Iodine deficiency. 
What about heavy metals? Do you, um, you know, I've seen some literature where they talk about that sometimes lead and mercury can actually be displaced with iodine. Is that even a true statement? So it's called a chaotropic effect. And it was described in the 1920s in a few case histories. And chaotropic means simply to displace. So we don't really know the mechanism of how iodine causes the body to release mercury and, and arsenic and aluminum and lead which I've seen, I've documented this in some patients. In other patients, it doesn't happen. So, it, and it's variable. And what's interesting with iodine is some patients that'll push out mercury and others that'll push out lead and others that'll push out arsenic. And, you know, it's, so they, they refer to it as, as this chaotropic effect. Um, I don't use iodine as the sole method to detox people from heavy metals because it's, it's, right. it's um, variable and it's not, there's other ways to do that, which I've been doing for 20 plus years that are, a little bit more effective, but iodine is part of the treatment plan, holistic treatment plan. Sure. Sure. And that makes a lot of sense. All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I hope that you realize the importance of iodine. Part two is coming out soon and you will see my discussion with Dr. Brownstein and the importance of salt and how we all need salt and even iodine for optimal health. So make sure to tune in and subscribe, make sure to follow and please leave a review if you enjoyed this episode. All right, guys, you know the drill, make sure to eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys soon. Take care. Bye.